these sweet spices, stacte and anica and galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be a like weight, and thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation. Where I will meet with thee, it shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that, to smell thereto, shall even be cut off from his people. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. The Lord bless you. Uh, now, in conjunction with that, with that, without going into a number of lengthy readings today, if you are making notes or following with me, in the book of Psalms, chapter 141, verses 1 and 2, David makes mention of the fact that he wanted his prayer to be set before God as incense. And then in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, where we find the beast and the elders before the throne of God and before the Lamb, they have harps and golden vials that are full of odors which are the prayers of the saints. Now notice that, that uh, they have these golden vials which are full of the prayers of the saints. And then in Revelation chapter 8, uh, verses 3 and 4, there is an angel that stands before the altar of God that has a golden censer. And uh, there's given to him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Brother Treese preached on that at our general conference. And uh, that was a tremendous, tremendous message. Now, I just inserted that to let you know that he preached from that passage. But um, there's quite a bit of mention in the Scripture of the subject that I want to talk to you about today. Sounds a little dull. Sounds a little out of... Um, character for you and I. It doesn't sound applicable to our day, but I want to preach today or teach today by the help of the Lord on the subject of why incense? Why incense? Why would God cause Israel and speak to Israel to use incense in their offerings unto the Lord? Now, incense comes from a Hebrew word, kotar, which means fumigation in a close place that drives out the occupants, it means a smoke, to turn into fragrance by fire. And uh, it's used as an act of worship unto God. It is a sacrifice. Now that is the Hebrew word and the meaning of that word. And I read to you from the book of Exodus as God was giving instructions to Moses on how to build the tabernacle, what to do with the tabernacle, and all of the instruments and articles that were to be included, in the midst of that, he tells him to take the sweet spices, stacte, anica, galbanum, and frankincense. They're to make a perfume out of it, a confection, after the art of the apothecary. It is to be tempered together, it is to be pure. It is to be holy. They're to beat it very small. They're to put it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where God meets with them. And the rest of Israel is commanded to not make this uh, perfume or this incense. They're not even to make according to the composition of it because it's holy unto God. And if they did do that, then they were cut off from the rest of the people and uh, not being uh, a native of the country as you would know uh, I have to study and research and try to find as you try to do 
the composition and the uh, spices and all of the things that went into this incense, where it originated and what it was far and all of that. Now, not to bore you with a bunch of uh, uninteresting facts, uh, Stacte is just simply uh, the gum of a tree that was used in this composition of spices. Hanukkah was from a shale that was found by the seashore, and um, it, uh, it too was added because it had a sweet smell. It was added to the composition and uh, to this particular uh, confection that they made uh, for an offering unto God. Galbanum was uh, derived from a shrub or a small tree that was found in that part of the country along with frankincense. Frankincense is spoken of a little more in the Scripture than the rest of these. But all of them were joined together in, um, in a special composition uh, that was the work of an apothecary uh, or, as the work of, or as the art of the apothecary. And uh, these spices blended together, laid up in the tabernacle of the Lord, and to be offered as a sacrifice unto God. Now, I recognize from the Scripture that only the priests were to offer incense unto God. I recognize today that you and I are a priesthood unto God. There are four different priesthoods that are mentioned in the Bible. There is the priesthood of Melchizedek. There's the Aaronic priesthood that I'm speaking to you from today. There's the priesthood of Jesus Christ, who is our great high priest, and then there is the priesthood of believers. Now, that does not put you out from under the authority of the man of God or anything of that nature. But it does give us the right as people of God to offer unto the Lord the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving and worship unto God. I'm glad today that I'm a part of this royal priesthood. Hallelujah. And that the priesthood of Jesus Christ is not after the order of the Aaronic priesthood, but it is built upon the priesthood of Melchizedek. Praise God. And uh, I don't want to get into that. We had a Sunday school lesson on Melchizedek one time. I taught on it uh, because it was a Sunday school lesson, and I enjoy studying about Melchizedek and teaching about him. And uh, so I taught on it that day, and uh, somebody told one of the women in our church, an older lady, said, that was a good Sunday school lesson, wasn't it? She said, I really enjoyed hearing Brother Kuhn teach about Melchizedek. Well, this lady wasn't too impressed. And she said, far as I'm concerned, they can just tear old Melchizedek out of the Bible. Uh, well, I don't want them to tear him out. I'm glad that we have a priesthood that uh, is under the priesthood of Jesus Christ that was built upon the priesthood of Melchizedek. Amen. Now, that's another subject, so let me hurry on. But um, as you know... In the study of the tabernacle, along with all of the other articles that went into the tabernacle and into their act of worship and praise unto God, one of the things that they had was an altar of incense. Now, if you entered into the outer court of the tabernacle, you come first to the brazen altar where they offered sacrifices to God. It was there that the Lord kindled a fire. And uh, I believe that that was a heaven-sent fire that uh, ignited uh, that altar and the sacrifice. And Israel had the responsibility of keeping that fire burning. It was to never, never go out. We all know that that altar was a place of dying. They offered their animals, their sacrifices, and um, it was a constant ongoing thing, which is a type of repentance for the New Testament church. Immediately following that was the brazen laver, where the priest washed, a type of baptism. Then you go into the holy place. Over to your right, there would be a table of showbread with 12 fresh baked loaves of bread, all uh, set apart for a representation of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Over to your left, there was the golden candlestick that was beaten of pure gold. It too was to never go out. It was lit in the morning, in the, or it was dressed, I should say, in the mornings and in the evening, a new supply of oil. It was the only light that was given inside of the tabernacle. If you marched on straight ahead, 
which was just a few steps, you would come to the altar of incense. Immediately behind that altar of incense, if you could imagine uh, there being a curtain across this vast tabernacle, and right in front of this pulpit, there was a curtain. Uh, right outside of that curtain, on your side, there would be a little altar there that was called the altar of incense. You would see a hanging curtain across the building, and there would be woven cherubims in, uh, on that veil that was across the tabernacle. If you could have stepped behind the veil, there would have been uh, a, a, a thing there, not, not so high and so large as this, as this pulpit, but there was the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, I'm not teaching on that, but you know probably as much or more about that than you do any other article of furniture in the tabernacle. It was a hollow box, and inside of it was um, the law, the Ten Commandments on the tables of stone. There was Aaron's rod that budded, and there was the golden pot of manna. The lid on that box was called the mercy seat, and uh, on each end of the mercy seat was the cherubims with their wings outstretched, touching one another. It was there at that mercy seat that the presence of God met with the priest every year when he come in for the time of atonement. But the, but the thing that is drawing my attention today, and I want to draw your attention to, is the altar of incense. It was a little square box, one cubit square. And uh, whatever your determination of a cubit is, some have it from 15 inches to 18 inches. It was a very small uh, piece of furniture. It was only two cubits high, which would probably be uh, about the height of you ladies' kitchen cabinet. And it was very, very small. Around the top of it, around the border here, was just a, a little crown. And on each corner there was horns and there was rings that staves went through and... Um, it was overlaid with pure gold. And it was there that the priest offered the offering of incense. And uh, to offer this incense unto the Lord, they would go out and they would take coals from the uh, brazen altar in the holy place. They would put them in a censer. Now, a censer is a vessel that you would carry uh, to put the coals in. It was called a censer, C-E-N-S-E-R. And um, they would take this. Apparently, they would take some coals, and maybe even when they left the altar, they would start with the incense. But then they would put some coals on that uh, little uh, altar of incense, and then they would take these spices that I just read to you about that was uh, composed of these four different components and brought together in a beautiful composition of like weight, and they would sprinkle this on the on the coals that was burning before the veil. And naturally, as you would know, there was a sweet smell that began to exude from this offering. And the aroma would begin to fill the air. Not only was there a beautiful aroma that began to fill the air, but there was a smoke that began to ascend. And, um, and it created somewhat of a pleasant atmosphere. In fact, it did create a pleasant atmosphere there was a sweetness to it there was a beautiful smell that uh, began to uh, fill the atmosphere and and began to float through the camp of Israel and uh, apparently this was quite a common thing now I might say to you that incense was within itself an offering that stood alone but not only did it stand alone as an individual entity within itself. It also was a complement to the other offerings of Israel. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. Now, I want you to think with me for just a minute. The goings on, and I'm taking another direction, a little turn here, and then we'll come back. I want you to think of the goings on in the camp of Israel at this particular time. The sacrifices Let's go back outside for just a moment. And let's remember that at the gate, at the holy place, at the entrance into the tabernacle, there was the constant offering of sacrifices. Animals were brought. They were bringing them there as, um, as thanksgiving offerings. They were bringing 
uh, the daily burnt sacrifice. They brought the sin offering, the trespass offering. They began to bring all of their offerings to Israel. And uh, the priest was out there working. He was killing the animals. There was the confession of sin over the heads of the animals. And uh, there was the bloodletting that was going on. I don't mean to be gory or, or, or sickening, but really, when you get down to it, it was a sickening environment. There was the lowing of cattle. There was the blading of sheep. There was the mourning of the doves. And there was the bawling and the crying and the dust and the pawing and, and uh, the wrestling and, and cutting throats and blood splattering and uh, dust flying. And, and it was just, if you didn't know what was going on, it would be like walking in a Pentecostal church and everybody was shouting. And you say, well, there's no order here. But there was. But it, it seemed to be just a mayhem, just, a, just, a, just everything just being uh, killed and hurt and crying and moaning and groaning. And then along with all of the crying and the moaning and the bleeding and the kicking and the dying and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the skinning and the flaying of the animals, along with that, there was the acrid smell of smoke that constantly filled the air. There was the burning of flesh. There was the burning of the hair and the intestines and the head of a red heifer. And there was the constant uh, ongoing of these sacrifices. I'm telling you, the priest was nothing but a bloody mess. And uh, if you've ever been around a slaughterhouse, there is a stench that nothing can describe. Dried blood, drying blood, dying animals. And there's all of the dung and there's all of the filth and the trash uh, that, that's around there. And they try to keep it clean. But, but it's a horrible, horrible scene. And then every time the sacrifice is offered. And now on a good day, the best day that could ever be in Israel. And it was never usually a common day. But the best day in Israel, there was at least two sacrifices. There was the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. That was the best. But I, I dare to say that, that they ever had days like that. There was always somebody that had sin. Somebody come with the thanksgiving. Somebody brought the crying, blading sheep of, of, of their offering to God. And the priest had to kill it. So if you stood there and you observed and you watched, or if you was involved, there was the constant smell and the stench and, and all of this dying going on. And many, many times you were right in the middle of it yourself because you had brought the sacrifice. And then uh, they, they would take this blood that, that they would catch and they would go inside of this beautiful tabernacle that we think in our mind is just an immaculate, sweet-smelling place. But it wasn't. They would go inside of there with that blood and they would begin to sprinkle everything. And uh, there was everywhere you turn, there's dying and there's blood. And uh, that old priest, I'm telling you, you can understand when you study the Levitical priesthood why a man could only bear the responsibility for 20 years, from 30 to 50. Because you see, it's a constant wrestling. It's a constant confession of sin. I did this. I failed God. I made a mistake. Here's my sacrifice. And the sacrifice is crying and dying. And, and you're smelling the smoke and the blood and the heat of the fire. And uh, it's just an ongoing, everyday hassle and tussle. And he's experiencing to this all of the time from daylight till dark into the shadows of the evening there is the crying and the blading and the waiting sacrifice and all of that is filling the atmosphere that's the worship that's the house of God and, um, and that's the way it was and then every year at the day of atonement Aaron would go behind that veil twice uh, on that day first of all he went for himself with the blood of a bullock and he went behind that veil and he walked around behind this, this Ark of the Covenant and he stood behind the mercy seat and he carried with him a censer in his hand and he sprinkled in that censer these beautiful uh, sweet smelling spices I told you about that's called incense. 
He, he would fill his censer with coals of fire and sprinkle, no doubt, much incense on the fire. And then he would walk around behind this Ark of the Covenant and uh, he would take the blood out of another vessel and he would sprinkle it on that beautiful, shining, precious, valuable mercy seat. And I won't get into all of the typology of that. But he would sprinkle that blood seven times toward the east. And then he would make his way back out uh, to the front of the camp. And there was two goats that was waiting. And uh, they were the atoning sacrifices. And they would kill one of the goats. And uh, they would take his blood and give it to Aaron. And then the process started again. The stench of the blood. And the blading of the goats and the, and the mourning of the turtle doves. It's just, it's just a cry. It's a mayhem. It's, it's just an unbearable existence that you have to face around the tabernacle. And so Aaron makes his way for the final time behind the veil. And somebody takes the goat that is alive. And they, they laid their hands on him. And they confess their sins. All of the sins of Israel. And they pick out a fit man. And that's another subject. And I've taught on that fit man. And they took a fit man and gave him this, this living goat. And he was to take it so far into the wilderness until he could not find his way back. Now both of these sacrifices are a type of Christ. One is a type of his death. Another is a type of his life. Not only is he the atoning sacrifice, but he is the scapegoat that bears away the sins of the world. Hallelujah. I'm glad Jesus Christ is our scapegoat, that he is our sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God that was slain. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for that. Amen. And Aaron would go back behind the veil the second time on the Day of Atonement. I used to teach that they, and I heard somebody else teach it, and they taught me wrong, and so I taught it wrong, that he had a rope wound around him, and he left the end of it hanging out from under the veil so that if the Lord killed him, they could drag him out. There's no Bible for that. That never occurred. Amen. Praise God. And uh, he would have been killed before he ever got that far. So he didn't need a rope. That's no part of the priest's garments. But uh, nevertheless, that's not my subject. But he would go back the second time. And he would offer a toning sacrifice for the sins of Israel. Now when the Bible said once a year he entered in there. That meant that he went first for his own sins. And then he went for the sins of the people. But let me tell you this. Whenever Jesus Christ died. He did not die for his own sin. He died for the sins of the people. Praise God. Now have you got the picture of what's going on? Here is a constant sacrifice. But along with that sacrifice. There is the offering of incense. Daily, they brought the incense. Daily, they would fill their censers with fire. And they would sprinkle uh, abundantly and, and uh, without reserve that, that sweet-smelling spice of incense on that fire. And the aroma would start, and it would begin to smell so sweet. Now keep in mind the sacrifice, the dying, the suffering, the burning, the smell of burning flesh. And, and the heat of fire and the crying and the lowing and the blading and, and then all of the stink of blood that has accumulated through the years and it's there. Now, one more turn in the road. Every one of us in this building today, and unless you have had a damaging experience in your life, everybody in this building today has an intricate nerve system in your body and especially in your nose and it's called an olfactory nerve O-L-F-A-C-T-O-R-Y olfactory nerve that is the nervous system if I can use that term of the nasal passages that picks up all of these scents and smells and you know, smells can be repulsive. Amen. They can be repulsive. Stinks. And, uh, and, and you, you know all about that. I don't have to go into any detail about the olfactory nerve system. You know what it does. That sense of smell, one of the five delicate senses. And you say, well, 
Oh, that's not important. Let me tell you something. That sense, that old factory nerve can save your life. If you walked into a house and you immediately picked up the scent of gas, you know, I'm in danger. I smell something. That, that sense of smell can, can change our attitude, can heighten our emotions. It can do a lot of things. It's, a, it's an intricate, delicate sense. I have men in my church that work offshore, and one of the big dangers for them is the, is the poison gas that, that can come out of an oil well. And, and, and the danger is not so much in the gas itself, but the danger is that when the gas comes from the ground, the first thing it does is destroy the old factory nerve. They can't smell. And so they just keep a working in that gas. That's the first thing it affects is, is the nasal passage and the olfactory nerve. And, and immediately it kills it. It's dead. And you just keep a working and, and you don't smell anything. And, and as a result of not being able to smell anything, that gas poisons you and in a few minutes you're dead. But if it didn't affect your olfactory nerve and you could smell it, then you would know to escape immediately. Now, hold on to that for just a moment because I'm teaching today on why would God cause Israel to use incense? Now, incense was a big thing for them. I want you to understand that. Whenever uh, Nadab and Abihu offered a, uh, incense to God on strange fire, God killed them. As I told you on the Day of Atonement, that high day in Israel, the greatest day in the camp, they they had to offer incense. Whenever they dedicated the tabernacle, I'm teaching to you about today. They, uh, they had 12 days of dedication. And there was a prince out of Israel that would come every day. And he would bring a spoon of 10 shekels weight of gold. And he would bring it full of incense. When they dedicated this tabernacle, every day it was a sweet incense that was arising. And, and, and it was affecting the old factory nerve. But it was doing it in a beautiful way. The sweet aroma, the sweet smell. And it was so sweet around that tabernacle. Whenever Korah and his band decided to invade the priest's office um, against the commandment of God, that's one of the things they wanted to do was offer incense. We want to get in on this sweet-smelling incense and offer it to God. And you know the story of how they were killed. There's no greater lesson in the Bible on rebellion than the story of Korah. Amen. There's some places we don't belong. Amen. And we need to learn the boundaries and the limitations of our uh, experience and our, and our authority and all of that. And uh, you know how that story ended. The ground swallowed them. They took the 250 brazen censers. They beat them into plates. And they attached them at the entrance of the tabernacle on, on the brazen altar. They took those, those uh, censers and beat them out flat. And, and put them around that altar and fastened them to it. Everybody that brought a sacrifice, the next thing they saw was a patched up altar that had plates on it. And they remembered, hey, I've got a place in the work of God and I better not violate that. Amen. Praise God. Now, that's not my subject, but that's a good subject. And we need to not touch the man of God, the anointed of God. We need to leave that alone. Amen. Now, let me go on and hurry to tell you that this was a great thing in Israel. Now, I've talked to you about the incense, its composition. I've talked to you about the importance of the altar of incense. I've talked to you about the sacredness of incense, what it affects, what the stench of Israel was like, and what it affected, and the old factory nerve system that all of us are a recipient of. Now, let me get to the heart of why God instituted incense in the camp of Israel. The reason that God gave them incense was not just for another offering, although if God wanted to do that, He has a sovereign right to do it. But I'm going to tell you why I believe that He gave them incense. And that was to cover up 
the smell and the stench and the dirt and the dying and the blood of a continual, eternal, unending sacrifice. Amen. Now stay with me. It didn't change the environment. It really didn't. It didn't change the smell. That stench was still there. But it covered it up. It made it bearable. It made it at least where you could stand to come to the premises of the tabernacle. Amen. They still had to sacrifice. The stench was there. The blood was there. The dying, the crying, the bleeding, and, and the constant striving, struggling, and sweating, and work of the priest was still there. But every once in a while he could lift up his head from that old stinking burning altar and that old factory nerve system was working well and he could smell that sweet aroma of incense and he'd say, hey, you know, this job's not so bad after all. I believe I'll be back tomorrow. I believe I'll keep on doing the work of God. It smells good around here. But let me tell you something, friend. When you got away from the incense, it started stinking again. Amen. And the further you get from the incense, the worse it stinks. And the worse the smell, and the, and, and the more horrible the crying, and, and the dying, and all of that. I'm telling you, the atmosphere and the environment of that tabernacle was one of stench, and blood, and dying, and death, and suffering, and all of that. But friend, it was never eliminated by incense. It was not intended to eliminate it, but it was intended to make the environment bearable and to make the day enjoyable just a little bit in spite of all of it. And you've got to remember, friend, the, the sacrifice of incense was activated, activated by fire, the fire from the brazen altar, the altar of, of repentance, the altar sacrifice that was to never go out. And friends, you hear me today, we must never let that fire go out in our lives. There must be a burning sensation within us that we have a repentant spirit and a forgiven spirit. Praise God. We must always activate our experience with God by that holy fire. Amen. Now let me simply say to you today from the word of the Lord that incense in the scripture is a type of prayer. As David said, he said, let my prayer ascend unto God as incense. It was at the time of the offering of incense that Zacharias at prayer time, at incense time, that Zacharias was inside of the temple offering his sacrifice and he heard from God about the birth of John the Baptist. Praise God. Let me tell you, friend, that prayer is the incense of this royal priesthood unto our God today. Amen. Hear me when I talk to you uh, in the finishing part of this Bible lesson today. And I'm not through, so stay with me a little bit. That every pastor in this building today is close to the suffering of people. Amen. I don't know about you, but I think every pastor is, is somewhat alike that has the heart of a shepherd. You may see us in the restaurant or sitting around together and we're laughing and we're, we're, we're kind of joking with each other and we're all having a good time. And you may say them preachers don't have a care in the world. They just, every time I see them, they just slapping each other on the back and, and they're just laughing and talking and, and everything is fine for them. But no, friend, that's not the real scene that's going on on the inside of a preacher's heart. Amen. He lives close to it. I remember I called Brother Simonson one day he was pastoring the Bible church in Indianapolis. I was in Columbus, and he was not yet superintendent. I called him one day. His wife answered the phone. I said, is your husband there? And she said, yes, he is. I said, what's he doing? She said, he's walking around in the house whistling. That sounded like a good thing. I said, well, he must be happy. Um, she, and I said, what's he whistling about? She said, no, he's not happy. I said, he's whistling to keep from crying. Well, I knew that. That wasn't a strange story to me. Amen. Every preacher in this building lives close to suffering and dying and heartache and sorrows and disappointments. I'm the last human in our church that watches them close the coffin. I watch every saint as they put that lid down in their face 
And I feel the loss and the hurt of another person that's gone into eternity. And you've got to stand with dignity and all of that. I, I, I hear the stories of ladies that have been abused, of boys that have been abused. I hear the crying and the hurt and the disappointment and the separation and the divorce and, and, and the abused kids. I see it and you see it. The rape and the robbery and the stealing and the dying. I'm telling you, friend, I live in a world that doesn't smell very good and it doesn't look very good. And I've been praying for 37 years, but it hadn't changed the environment. It hadn't changed society. But I want you to know something, friend. Uh, there's a sweetness about prayer that makes it all bearable. Uh, and I'm able to keep walking with God uh, because there's something that sweetens up my life. I thank God for the power of prayer today. Hallelujah. I thank God that there's something in the midst of all of this that makes it worthwhile. Praise God. That's the reason we're trying to be a little jovial, pat each other on the back, have a good time. Most of, most of you come here with a heavy heart. You may, you may come here and lay your burdens aside for two or three days, check in a motel. You may, you may kindly find a little shield against the bills that's at the house, against the church note that's waiting, against the church problem, or a dozen church problems. You may be, you may shut the door to the rebellion of somebody that you got words passing a petition, and God delivers from that horrible atmosphere. But, but some of you are sitting here today without a piano player, without an organ player, without, without a spirit of cooperation, and you're trying to get something from God. Some of you dear moms and dads, your children are God knows where. They're on a missing bulletin somewhere. They're, 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 their life is torn. They've been married two or three times. You're trying to raise grandkids, and your own mother's in the nursing home and don't know where she's at. I'm telling you, friend, we live in a world that is screeching and dying and crying and bawling and hurting on every side. But thank God there's somebody that knew where we was going to be. And he said, I'm going to give you some incense. I'm going to give you the sweet spice of prayer. And it can cover it all up and make it all bearable. Praise God. And it can make your life enjoyable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so we'll come together, saints and ministers alike, and we'll fellowship this week and we'll shout and, and run and jump and have a good time and get charged up for revival. That's what we ought to do. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not against that. I'm not beating you for that. God knows that's why we have meetings like this. And, uh, oh, I'll get charged up by Brother Huntley and I want to go home and, and, uh, and preach like I've never preached before. I appreciate what's going on in this meeting. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. But I've been to hundreds of these. You've been to hundreds of them. And I might as well just pull the rug out from under your jerk to cover off or whatever you want to call it. Whenever Friday night gets here and you get in that car and you start home Friday night or you start home Saturday morning, boy, you may drive out the gate and say, thank God for that campground. Boy, we had a time. Look at your wife and smile and say, Boy, we had a nice room. Enjoyed being with you. Thank God for the food. We've just had a good time. And you start driving down that road. And you start heading to your city. And after a while, you get closer and closer. And somebody starts getting in the car with you. And trouble starts getting on board. And your old heart gets heavier and heavier. And you get to feeling lonelier and lonelier. And I don't have a neighboring pastor for several miles. I don't know of anybody I can talk to. I'm in this thing by myself. And you get there and the sacrifice is going on. And the crying and the hurting and the suffering. Uh, and you feel like, God, uh, I've stood all of this I can stand. Uh, I'm burnt out. I'm worn out. I'm tired out. Uh, but, oh, friend, listen to me. Uh, you can make a trip down to that little church uh, all by yourself. Uh, and you can begin to talk to God. Uh, it may not change anything but I'm telling you it sweetens up the atmosphere and you can say God I can stand it one more day I'm going to hang in here praise God I'm glad there's something to sweeten up our lives hallelujah 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 let me tell you and I believe in the wonders and signs and miracles I believe in how could I stand here tonight 
and knock miracles and lay it on of hands and signs and wonders. How could I stand here today and speak derogatorily of that when I'm a miracle myself? God healed me 37 years ago of an incurable disease. If I'd have come walking in here then, I don't know if I can even walk like that. I'd have come like this 37 years ago. But oh, I can walk straight today. God straightened out my leg. He healed my body. I'm a miracle. Praise God. I believe in miracles and signs and wonders. But I don't know. I don't know about you, Brother Pastor. But everybody in my town don't get their healing. Everybody in my church don't get their healing. I pastor people that pardon the plainness. They got slobber running off of their chin, dripping down on their clothes right now. Dried food on them in a nursing home. Talking out of their head. I preached an old brother's funeral the other day, 94 years old. Been in bed for the last seven or eight years. Every time I'd pray for him, he'd cry because he couldn't go to church. Totally blind. Helpless. Oh, I like to hear about the lame walking and the deaf hearing and all of that. I pastor a couple in my church. They got two healthy boys, but they got one little boy that is totally blind. He's deaf. He's severely mentally retarded. He's still in diapers at age six. And he's never still. And he's like an animal in church. They just, it's just almost an incorrigible thing. And you say, well, can't God do something about it? Yes, God can do something about it. He could clean out the graveyards. He could clean out the nursing home. I'm sorry to tell you that he don't. And I don't know how you preach. I think I know. I got to somehow convey to you that God loves you and he cares about you. Even if you're dying with cancer, he's still your God. And don't you lose out. Praise God. I got to somehow make you know that God is your God in spite of what may happen to you in life. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. Prayer does not always change everybody's circumstances. It doesn't always turn everything around. But you know what it does? It makes it where we can stand it. Hallelujah. It adds some sweetness to the atmosphere. It adds some joy in the midst of sorrow. I'm telling you, friend, I'm glad that there is a secret place of prayer. I'm glad that there is a place that we can dwell in the presence of the Almighty God. Hallelujah. I wish I could tell you that if you'd pray enough, it'd change everything. And you believe God for everything you can believe God for. But when you get through and the miracle doesn't occur, you just keep on praying. And brother, it's going to be like incense. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can stand it, Lord. It's hard and it's horrible. But I can stand it because I feel the sweetness of your presence. would never get sick if you would pray you would never you would never suffer bad eyes arthritis rheumatism let me tell you some prayer was never designed to make you immune to things now that doesn't mean that God can't keep you from things and he, he, he can't help you in all of that don't don't take out of context what I'm saying I'm simply saying to you that faith in God and walking with God is not an immunity factor. It's not a safety net. It doesn't protect you from everything that comes along in life. But I'm going to tell you what it does. It helps that spiritual olfactory nerve that when it gets so tough and the stench is unbearable and the hurt is beyond description, you can go through that rent veil into the presence of Almighty God Hallelujah. I'm glad to tell you the veil has been pushed back. Praise God. And when you get close to the altar of incense, you're close to the mercy seat. Hallelujah. When you get to the altar of incense, you're close to the Word of God. When you get close to the altar of incense, you're at Aaron's rod that buds. You're at the pot of manna. I'm telling you, friend, you can draw near to the throne of God and you can find grace to help and you can find mercy 
in the time of your need and in the time of your sorrow. Praise God. I'm glad the Lord provided something in the midst of it all. Praise God. I'm not a bitter, uh, sarcastic pastor that's tired of all of the things that we face. That's not my point. My point is to tell you that, that we're exposed to this. And every pastor in here today is closer to it than anybody else. And this man is probably closer to it sometimes than we are. And you bear the burdens heavy on your shoulder. It's the daily thing. I told you a few moments ago that, um, that the minimum load of the day was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. I don't care, Brother Preacher. You can go to the Pacific. You can go to the Atlantic. You can go anywhere you want to go. But there's that burden that weighs on your heart. Amen. I'd like to go somewhere and feel free. I'd like to feel uh, that the air was clear, that, me, that the atmosphere was clear. Uh, but the only way I can do that is to go to God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you something, friend. Uh, there's a power in prayer. Praise God. We need to learn to tap into the sweet incense of prayer. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. We need to know how to touch Him in the midst of our sorrows and in the midst of our hurts. How could Jeremiah face what he faced? Daniel in, in, in Babylon and Ezekiel by the river Kibar. How could they stand it? Except that there is a rent veil and there is a place that they can go to God in prayer. Let me tell you, friend, our Lord himself prayed in a garden and said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. You know as well as I know the cup did not pass, but the sweet incense of prayer made the cup bearable to drink. Amen. Paul asked God three times, remove this thorn from me, God. Prayer did not remove the thorn, but it provided the grace. I'm telling you, friend, the dying may keep on going, uh, and the blood shedding may keep on going, uh, but there's some incense that we can offer, uh, and there's some sweetness to this life that we can find. Hallelujah. And if you don't have some incense in your life, you're going to get sick of it. You're going to get sick of it. Praise God. The only thing that keeps me from getting sick of it is praying. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Oh, the battles we fight. The struggles. The hurts. The disappointments. You don't ever get away from it. That acrid smell of smoke always fills the air. I was preaching in Shreveport for Ted Danes a few months ago teaching a couple of teaching a family life seminar don't ask me to do one of them I ain't no good at that I don't know if I'm any good at this but I, I know I'm not at that and uh, I've heard too many fusses I sat up too many nights and watched the sun come up with people a tongue lashing each other dear God I, I get the nervous willies somebody says we had a fuss before church we need to talk to you after church Dear God, we want to see you in the office, Brother Coon. I said, no, let's don't go in the office. Let's stay here. You know, if you can keep them out here in front of the altar, at least they don't pull each other's hair and uh, don't get in a fight. And You can shuffle them off a little bit every once in a while, you know. But if you get in the office, it's a half of the night affair. And they go back to when, who, who laid the chunk? I don't know what to do. Dear God. And you know, you just, sometimes you just say, well, and you, you, you may say, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just enthralled with all of this. You ain't been around long enough yet. You ain't heard enough bawling yet. You ain't smelled enough smoke yet if you still just, oh, it's just hoop de doo da You ain't preached enough funerals yet. You ain't been subpoenaed to court enough yet. You ain't preached in the jail enough yet. I used to wonder why my mom and daddy sat on the front porch when there was so many good pine trees to ride down. They just sitting up there rocking. And I'm out here riding down pine trees. And I say, my God, y'all could ride a big one down big as y'all are. Why don't y'all come out of here? You know, I found out what that sitting on the porch is like. I don't even care about riding down trees myself now. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
I see all these guys. Oh, if I, Brother Coon, you, know, you, you got a church open. Uh, you ain't going to resign yours, are you? If I could just get me a church. Well, thank God. I, I love you for feeling that way. But I feel like sending you a sympathy card. You're going to be like a friend of mine. He took a church and somebody said, how's it going, brother? He said, oh, I'm sleeping like a baby since I took that church. He said, I sleep two hours and wake up and cry two hours. Well, that's the story. That's the way it is. You go ahead and get it, buddy. Bless God, you're going to wind up one of these days and you're going to be calling the superintendent and your friends and your buddies and you're going to say, I can't stand this. I need a, I need a three-week vacation to Acapulco and I don't have the money to go. What in the name of God am I going to do? This place stinks. I'm going to tell you what you do. You get on your knees and you say, here's some incense, Lord. Sweeten up the atmosphere. I'm telling you, God, I've stood all I can stand of this. But hallelujah, there's a power in prayer. Glory to God. And you can leave out of there shouting the victory and on fire for God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Well, I was telling you about teaching for Brother Danes. I always try to look godly. But I, I backslid enough. I got a pair of tennis shoes and some sports shirts. And I like to, I'd like to just go off somewhere and, and nobody bother me about preaching. Now, if y'all, if that don't bother you, you ain't preached enough yet. I tell my wife, she says, let's go out and eat today after Sunday school. I said, no, not today. I'd rather eat a bologna sandwich. Have you got any cold cornbread at the house? I'll eat cornbread and milk today. She says, why? I said, I can't stand to, to, to sit down and eat today. And, and four people come up to me and say, Brother Coon, what do you think about that barbed wire fence that Joe Blow, I, I, I saw it on the radio yesterday. They wired up a wire from, from Iraq to Iran. Could you tell me in the Bible what that means? Oh, I've explained them horses and riders and, and all that. I'd like to eat something and y'all just leave me alone a few minutes. I just preach my guts out. <laughs> I'm just, you know, maybe I'm too plain, but <laughs> that's just me. Now, don't none of y'all come up asking me nothing either. I'm tired. Hallelujah. I don't care what kind of old bale cow you got. Praise God. Just, just wait a little while. Hallelujah. So I had on my sports shirt. Brother Danes had on his suit. Sister Coon didn't go with me. And I like her real good, and I'm trying to hold on to her. So I said, Brother Danes, take me down here to town. I want to buy my wife a gift. I'm going to buy her some perfume. That's, that's a good idea. Now, I ain't preaching on that, but that's part of them marriage seminars. Hallelujah. Go buy your wife some perfume. Buy her something. You better not go home without something, I'll tell you that. So I had on my sports shirt, and we went up to this perfume counter. And, of course, they want to spray some on you. You leave out there smelling like a jungle bunny or something. You just, you know, just, you, smell, you don't know what you smell like. You put a little behind this ear and some on this thumb and, you know, whew, my Lord. So I walked up there in my sports shirt. A lady said, could I help you, sir? I said, yes, ma'am. I'd like, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I'd like to buy some perfume for my wife. That old, she had on them half glasses. She looked out over that counter at me. I'm here in my tennis shoes. She said, you a preacher, ain't you? I said, oh, God. Oh, I'm 150 miles from Gina. Here's an old Jezebel, and she thinks I'm a preacher. Where can I go? Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I looked back at that old woman, and I said, no, ma'am, I ain't a preacher. He said, you're not. I said, no, ma'am. I said, I'm a disc jockey. 
I work for the radio station. And this is my manager here with me. And I just come in to buy some perfume for my wife. She, she really pulled him glasses. She said, now, mister, you might can fool somebody, but you don't fool me. You're a preacher. What kind are you? I said, I'm an apostolic Jesus name preacher. Hallelujah. Well, good. Let me tell you about my divorce. I said, oh, God, just sell me some perfume. I got enough of that in Gina. Amen. Now, does any of y'all know what I'm talking about? Do you know? Oh, dear God. Oh, it gets to stinking sometimes. Oh. Now, I love people. I was raised in Gina. I love them people. It don't sound like I do sometimes, but I do. I really love them. They treat me so good. But I moved from a pretty large city to Gina. Brother Foss, I told him about you buying me them shoes this morning. You wouldn't hear to hear it. Was you here? Why didn't you raise your hand? I didn't see you. He's my buddy. I'm just picking at him. Hallelujah. You know what it's like over there. Out there in the middle of them woods. And when I moved to Gina, now I'm, 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 I'm telling you, don't you come over there calling no saints and sinners at 8.30 at night. They in the bed asleep. They roll up a sidewalk. I'm telling you, when it, before dark, there ain't a car on the street in Gina. Well, there ain't no reason to be there. I mean, you'd be parked in front of an empty building if you was, so ain't no use in parking the street. So, here I go trotting off down to Gina. Lord tells me to go to Gina. I have a church of about 175 or 200, two choirs, brass band, good saints, good income. And I go trotting off down to Gina, and they just run the preacher off. But here comes the holy apostle from Indiana. He's got the answer. So here I come, sixth in Sunday school. You say amen, and it's just like you shot a bunch of quails. They all got four sets of doors. They all got them a door, and they bloom. They split nine ways, and they but four doors for them all to get out of. And I get down there, and I say, now, dear Lord, what's going on here? It gets, it gets pretty smelly. My old factory nerve works good. And I preach and I preach and I preach. And the Lord's helped us. And it's a wonderful spirit there now. It's not, it's not even like the same place. I could have preached in the first Baptist church and got as much response sometimes. But I didn't beat them on the head. I just tried to love them and work with them and and so the Lord has helped us after almost 14 years. Now, it's funny. It just tickles the fire, fire out of me, fire, in Gina, fire in here. Uh, it just tickles the life out of me now when I look back and think about it. But it wasn't nearly about funny then. On a Sunday night, I preached, and, and I'm telling you, the blood was stinking, and the bawling was going on. And the dying and everything else that goes with it. And I had all I could stand. And I, I never told anybody in Gina this. Don't y'all go tell them. I just turned around, Brother Holly, at the front pew. And I was crying. I wasn't joking. You can laugh now and I can laugh. But it wasn't funny then. I was crying. I was weeping my eyes out. And I said, God, and I was just as serious as I could be. And I meant it. And I'd still mean it today. I said, God, I want you to do one of three things for me right now. I want you to let me die. Or I want you to move me. And ain't nobody want you when you feel that way. 
Or I said, God, I want you to make me like this place. And I don't care which one it is, but you do it for me, Lord. I can't stand it any longer. You know what I did? I dropped a little incense on a fire. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, it didn't change anything, but it got to smelling better. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm telling you, I got up from there, and I began to like it ever better ever since. Better and better and better. I'm telling you, friend, there's something about God that can help you in the midst of your environment. I don't care where you're at. If you're doing the will of God, you stay there. Amen. I don't care how ignorant you look. I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm telling you, you just stay put. Glory to God. But you pray. Hallelujah. Let's stand. You got troubles at home? I'm, I could talk on and on. I'm not through, but I'm going to stop. I hope you got what I'm saying. I attended the funeral of one of our preachers the other day. I looked into the eyes and the face of a man that's just a little older than me. He's in his 50s. Just a little older than me. And I stood looking at a swollen man in a casket that had died in his sleep a day or two before. I was there the night he got the Holy Ghost as just a little boy. Remember it so well. And uh, 12 years ago, pastor in one of our churches, he was smitten with a stroke. Hadn't been able to walk. Could barely talk. And his little wife at that funeral was nothing but a spindly thread of human flesh. She had waited on that man and helped him. And oh, she's a sweet lady, and he was a wonderful man. Twelve years in a wheelchair. You reckon how many times she prayed? How many times did she say, God, I want you to heal my husband? But somehow it was not the will of God to heal him. I'm going to tell you what. That kind of life gets rugged, and it gets rough. How do you bear that, Brother Coon? There's an incense of prayer. It may not change it. You may not get out of the wheelchair, honey. And you may not get out of the nursing home. And my life may not get any easier, but there's a rent veil. And there's an altar. And there's a place of prayer. Hallelujah. And it's going to make it bearable. It's going to make it sweet. And I'm going to keep on living for God. And hold on to God. Let's ask the Lord to help us this afternoon, would you? Let's talk to God. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Wherever you're at today, keep the incense ascending to God and let it thrill your soul. Please like, comment, and subscribe.